Hello, my name is Robert Baines. I am the president and CEO of the NATO Association of Canada. We are a charitable organization dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Uh, this is something that most Canadians don't have to worry about on an everyday basis. Security is something that barely crosses their mind, which is great. That's a wonderful thing, uh, but it's something that we've built towards. It's a uh, uh, it's a state of being that most people for most of human history have never dreamed of, uh, not having to worry about security. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, but it also comes with its own challenges and dangers. Uh, and the NATO Association is here to make sure that Canadians do think about security every once in a while, because if you don't, if you ignore it, if you let it pass you by, um, the chances are that you'll take it for granted and stop working at it. Uh, and the thing is that Canada has spent so long, decades, helping to build up organizations like NATO and the rest of the rules-based international order, uh, which see things in a non-zero-sum way, uh, i.e. that means that everybody contributes a little bit and gets a huge amount out of it, and security especially. Uh, acts that way. Uh, we found this after the uh, end of the Second World War. We realized that isolationism, division, is what makes us weak. Unity is what makes us strong. Unity is the only way to maintain peace through strength. So that's really what we're trying to communicate, and that Canada is part of an amazing organization, and one which has great ties with our fellow NATO allies. 31 of them now, hopefully 32 in the near future, uh, but we have three great NATO allies today here with us, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. We're going to have a great discussion uh, about uh, the state of the alliance and especially the state of uh, the eastern flank of NATO, uh, where the enhanced forward presence uh, exists for NATO. Uh, and I I'm really just thrilled today to be able to have this discussion in this context. Uh, there's a lot to be worried about in the world today. There's a lot to be uh, proud of at the same time, though, as far as NATO is concerned. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of opportunity before us. Uh, and uh, I see that I think Ambassador Oslins is uh, sending a note, so I will try to add him as well. Uh, but for now, uh, we might as well just get started. Uh, I'm happy to say that we've got uh, two wonderful uh, discussion partners here today for our three ambassadors. Uh, that's Ali Sayani. Uh, he's one of our program editors here at the NATO Association, along with Matthew Damico, who is also another program editor here at the NATO Association. Uh, the association prides itself on being uh, absolutely uh, injected with such energy from youth, uh, from students, from those who are just launching in their career. Uh, because that is the future of Canada, and I'm proud to say that Ali and Matthew are two great examples of the future of Canada, uh, and their engagement makes me proud uh, to see what the future of Canada will be. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Ali and Matthew, and we'll get Ambassador Oslins on here uh, as soon as possible. Uh, thanks so much, and you two take it away. Thank you so much, Robert, for that very kind introduction. Uh, before further ado, I think uh, we'd, lo we'd love to introduce our distinguished guest. So uh, today we are honored to be joined by His Excellency Marcus Rava, who became the ambassador of Estonia to Canada in 2022. Since graduating from Tallinn University in 1989 with a degree in electrical engineering, and in 1992 from the Estonian School of Diplomacy, Ambassador Rava worked as a diplomat in the Estonian embassies in Riga and London, later becoming Estonia's ambassador to France and permanent representative to UNESCO. In the last decade, he has also acted as ambassador to Greece, Cyprus and Albania, as well as directing divisions for trade policy and business diplomacy development. Thank you for joining us today, Ambassador. Pleasure, pleasure is mine. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, also, we are grateful to be joined today by His Excellency Darius Skusevicius, who became ambassador of the Republic of Lithuania to Canada in 2019, and whose country will be hosting next week's summit in Vilnius. Prior to his appointment, he held various positions, such as the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Lithuania from 2015 to 2017, and Director of the National Agency for Youth and Students from 2006 to 2008. The ambassador holds a bachelor's degree in software systems from Vilnius University, a degree in business management and administration from the University of Management and Economics, and a master's degree from the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University. Thank you for being with us today. 
Pleasure is pleasure is mine. Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and begin with our questions. Thank you again, Robert, for the kind words, and thank you, ambassadors, for joining us on such an important time in the calendar year. The first question is for Ambassador Skusevichis. NATO's Enhanced Forward Presence, or EPF in short, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland was established in 2016 in response to insecurity and instability along NATO's eastern borders. Canada is one of the leading states of the EFP alongside Germany, the United States, and the UK. With first deployments in 2017 and later reinforced following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, what role does the enhanced forward presence currently play in strengthening the alliance and security on NATO's eastern borders? So, uh, uh, good good day, everybody. One more time, and uh, yes, EFP is uh, is a major development in uh, in in past decade uh, in terms of NATO, and uh, and the main thing is uh, <clears throat> is deterrence. Because uh, uh, the thinking philosophy behind is that uh, having uh, multinational uh, troops uh, on uh, on the soil actually present is a deterrence. Uh, so so that's why nations uh, in the alliance uh, agreed to 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 be part of uh, this mechanism. And in Lithuania, it's led by by Germany. But you rightly mentioned in Latvia, it's uh, it's Canada in the lead, and uh, <clears throat> and what what they do, they they are posted on uh, on uh, rotational basis. Uh, it's not only lead countries, but other allies are also you know adding their forces to that. But uh, but they're training together, they're checking the interoper interoperability capabilities. Uh, they they are working together with with the host nation very closely. To be ready if anything happens to uh, to you know to 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 work together, uh, but uh, from what we see now and uh, why this is still ongoing debate, uh, we see now that uh, neighbors uh, in our region are very aggressive and uh, unpredictable, and therefore we we think that uh, that uh, uh, this. EFP forces should be even strengthened, and that was the uh, the the agreement in Madrid last summit that uh, EFP battalions should be scaled up to brigade level. So what is happening now? It's exactly this: we we are talking. Uh, each of the nation uh, host nation is talking with. Uh, uh, lead countries and other partners, what can be done to really reinforce and to increase uh, presence of allied troops in, in our countries. But uh, but look, it, it works. It really works. And uh, uh, we heard a number of reassurances from other partners that uh, every inch, every centimeter, no matter in which uh, you know system you are, every centimeter will be protected. And uh, and by by placing uh, actual troops on the ground, it's uh, it's working as a deterrence measure. The enhanced forward presence is certainly a lesson in collaboration. Ambassador Rava, would you like to um, add on about the importance of the enhanced forward presence? I think uh, the uh, the the presence of the allied partners in. Uh, each of our countries uh, is a very good sort of uh, practical example also of the uh, uh, of the fact that NATO is a defense alliance that there are not not only our immediate neighbors but uh, sometimes uh, allies from across the ocean who are there uh, to establish what we call deterrence but then for the what the general public uh, would uh, uh, would understand as you know outright help in case something would happen so that is uh, uh, the, that is uh, kind of their presence has also uh, I don't know practical and public uh, uh, 
sort of uh, dimension to it uh, as regards the, the, the general population in Estonia, Latvia or Lithuania. That's perhaps the, the only aspect that uh, I would like to add. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rava. Um, and I've noticed that we are now joined by our other ambassador, the ambassador of Latvia, Kashvars Ojo Lynch. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce Ambassador Ojo Lynch. Um, we're very honored to be joined today by His Excellency Kaspar Ojo Lynch, who, will become, who became Latvia's ambassador to Canada in 2021. Ambassador Ojo Lynch began his diplomatic career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1994, mm -hmm. working at the International Organizations Department in the Security Policy Division, as well as later heading the Russia Division and Security Policy Department. His Excellency has served at the Embassy of Latvia in Sweden and the USA and represented Latvia in the Trilateral Latvia-Russia OSCE Commission. The ambassador holds a master's degree in history from the University of Latvia and has been previously posted as ambassador of Latvia to the Czech Republic, Croatia, and Denmark, followed by his leadership of the Security Policy and International Organizations Directorate between 2019 and 2021. Thank you very much for joining us, Ambassador. Um, currently, we are talking about the enhanced forward presence, um, specifically with the Canadian role of the enhanced forward presence. Um, how has that strengthened the deterrence capabilities of the NATO alliance? Ambassador, you're currently muted right now. Hold on a second, Ambassador. Um, could you hit the unmute button on the bottom left of the screen? The mute button's at the bottom left. It's beside the stop video. You're currently still muted. Okay, while we wait on Ambassador Ojo Lynch, um, we were gonna move forward ahead in the discussion. Um, you can take it away here, Ali. Right, so uh, like you mentioned, uh, Canada has a significant presence, particularly in Latvia with the EFP. Um, what concerns might there be in boosting the EFP as we go into Vilnius uh, and with the, the other members who are also supporting the enhanced forward presence? What are the concerns on the ground between the Baltic states and how might they be addressed? I wouldn't say that uh, it's it's concerns, but we should we should understand and what we what we clearly see with uh, with the ongoing war in in Ukraine is that um, we we didn't invest uh, for quite long uh, time enough into into our defenses and we and we are in quite uh, quite a difficult situation where uh the like if if there would be enough of resources to uh, to do all of the things we are willing i think that that would be an easy answer but uh, now what we see with uh, with uh, with uh, low defense spendings defense industries uh, are not uh, developed enough with uh, even in Canada you, you you've heard how many vacant uh, positions you have in Canadian uh, armed forces uh, same same is happening in uh, you know across across the alliance but I think the look the leaders in Madrid already agreed that there will be a scale up so the question now is uh, how to how and when to do that 
And uh, scaling up means not only that uh, uh, host uh, like main uh, uh, countries responsible, for example, Canada and Latvia, uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, Canadians only have to commit to send troops. It means that all the infrastructure has to be ready to do that. Because they are coming not for one week. We are planning it to be, you know, permanent, uh, permanent, of course, rotating uh, every every period of time. But you have to have infrastructure. So so uh, what is happening now, at least in, in Lithuania, we, we just heard from uh, from Germans that, uh, yes, they are committed to increase the troop counts to 4000 in coming years uh, when Lithuania will be ready. Because, uh, you know, this means 4,000 troops, means that uh, they are rotating, means that you have to have at least twice of this size. You have to have at least 8,000 troops ready for rotations. Lithuania on its side has to be ready with infrastructure. So we are doing everything we can uh, on, on, on our side. Uh, our main partner, Germans, are doing uh, everything they can on, on their side. And uh, and I think in, in all the countries, uh, similar conversations are happening and we are moving uh, forward with this. Because this is at least for Lithuania, uh, deterrence and defense is one of, one of the main uh, elements and priorities for, for this summit. Okay, thank you. And Ambassador Rava, any thoughts on that? Uh, mm, well, uh, what... Uh, I know that uh, the, the, the um, uh, decisions of the Madrid summit uh, are indeed uh, in the process of being put in place. That uh, also in Estonia means uh, a lot of uh, challenges for the, um, for the government, for instance, to enlarge the uh, training area. Uh, which with a new uh, amount of uh, troops present in Estonia, uh, in addition to housing, what Arus mentioned already, they need also places to train with uh, heavy weaponry. And this is, you know, uh, hundreds and thousands of hectares of training grounds being enlarged. And there is a huge discussion with the communities involved uh, and not a very easy discussion that sometimes so that is, uh, in Estonia, this is, again, publicly a very visible uh, thing uh, that is very directly linked to the need to uh, increase the uh, allied presence in Estonia and what Estonia uh, on its turn has to do and will do. On the, uh, on the other side, I know there is an agreement with the, between Estonia and the lead nation in Estonia, UK, uh, respective authorities, how, uh, when, and uh, and uh, mm, what is is uh, to be done in order that the uh, Madrid's decisions will be put in place, will be implemented. But that is an ongoing work, and uh, and uh, I'm not in uh, in course of every detail of that that process. Ambassador Rava, with the admittance of Finland to NATO last year, Sweden's membership bid is on the table, and President Zelensky has renewed calls for Ukraine's membership. What does NATO's future in membership expansion look like, and what are the implications of this on Baltic security? Um, well, the, uh, uh, the reasons, I guess, or uh, or uh, the views how Estonia, or I guess also other Baltic states, view NATO's expansion uh, stem from our own experience you know, 20 years ago. And uh, having uh, uh, settled or achieved that level of security, regardless of what is happening uh, or what is being committed by Russia currently, uh, this is a proof that uh, NATO membership uh, uh, for us, a proof for us that it is uh, uh, 
the best security guarantee that there can be. And um, I think it is the Finnish people who changed their mind uh, almost 180 degrees during uh, some weeks only last spring. Uh, that also proves that uh, NATO membership is a, uh, the best security guarantee that there ever can be. And that same applies also to Ukraine. And, uh, uh, and uh, we are fortunate to be in NATO since 20 years, almost 20 years by now. And Ukraine is unfortunate not to be yet. Uh, so uh, mm, uh, I think uh, as also the leaders have said uh, at previous summits, place of Ukraine is in NATO. Uh, as, uh, and it is up to each and every country to decide upon their uh, uh, security arrangements. It's not about third countries telling who, uh, uh, who will guarantee whose uh, security and so on. So it's about the country themselves to decide. Uh, so these have been the crucial elements in the NATO, large, NATO enlargement process and, and will remain. Will the main Thank touch. you, Ambassador Rava. Um, Ambassador Skusevicius, um, how does the admittance of these new members um, elevate the importance of this upcoming summit? So, uh, look, with Finland on board, we, we already are one step forward, uh, looking looking forward again to, to see Sweden in, in the club. And this definitely changes our security uh, environment because, uh, yes, uh, Finland and Sweden are long-standing partners of NATO, lots of joint exercises, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, being in the alliance means that uh, they will be integral part of, uh, of defense planning. Uh, and uh, and this is uh, this is great news for for whole our region that uh, that those countries their people decided that uh, that they want to to join the alliance. Uh, same goes with uh, with uh, Ukraine, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we we were uh, always uh, strong supporters of uh, open door policy uh promises uh, to to ukraine and georgia have been made uh, years ago that uh, at some point they will become uh, nato members and what they see what we see now with uh, with ukraine how they're fighting how their military looks like uh, that uh, you know uh, they are more than ready uh, to be part of this uh, defense uh, alliance uh, the only question now is uh, when when we will have uh, proper permissions for them to become fully fledged member. There are examples in the history when when countries still uh, they they were accepted to NATO even having some uh, some internal uh, 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 troubles. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, the idea of upcoming summit is to uh, move forward to make uh, tangible steps in ukraine's partnership with uh, nato and uh this these developments are still negotiated in uh, in brussels by by our ambassadors and of course uh, we'll know for sure what's the outcome of the summit only only i think when when it ends because uh, when leaders meet, uh, they will be making final decisions on on many of the topics, including uh, you know what will be the formulation on uh, on, on on EFP uh, continuation, what will be the wording on uh, on Ukraine, etc., etc., etc. So, but uh, but yeah, that's 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 our position. Ambassador Ojo Lynch. Um... What perspective can you offer from, from Latvia about the implications of including additional members to NATO? And what are the implications of this on Baltic security? Well, thank you once again for inviting me. And I'm sorry for uh, sort of unsuccessful attempts to, to join in your conversation. So I, I was, uh, I started to listen to conversation as a, apparently as a, 
as a, uh, a listener. And uh, I, I appreciated that one, but I apparently I have to speak as well and as it was advertised. So thank you very much for, for your patience and, and, and all of that. So, um, well, I think... Um, um, I think it's 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 been clear that NATO has been tr uh, tremendously success, uh, successful in uh, in defending its um, uh, its its members and uh, deterring of of any let's say at, attack or, or threat. And this has been for more than seventy years. So next year is seventy five years. So all of the countries who have joined NATO have experienced uh, that that security. We have seen. Uh, that the countries that uh, had a long-standing experience of non-alignment and uh, neutrality, uh, that even they decided that they are a policy that has been um, uh, working during two world wars. Uh, I'm speaking about Sweden in particular here, not not Finland. That this policy may not serve them in the current security situation in Europe, when Russia is is aggressively attacking its neighboring countries and and basically has become a indeed very very un unpredictable uh, partner so it was the actions in uh, the aggression against ukraine was very uh, uh, unpredictable so the way the brutality of the war that russia is waging against uh, um, uh, uh, ukraine is um, is has been un un unpredictable so and right now the events that took place like in last couple of weeks in russia so you couldn't predict that one and and so the many 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 things that we have experienced in the past is is suggesting basically that uh, that you should aspire for um, collective security defense uh, uh, collective security uh, within NATO and that is seems to be the best uh, guarantee for the for, for the security of those countries and for the rest of the countries. Uh, well, we have seen that Russia has attacked uh, the non-members of of, of 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 NATO. That's 2008 Georgia, and then in, in uh, successive uh, attacks on on Ukraine. So apparently, so the uh, um, uh, the hard learned lesson and and uh, truth of the fact is that uh, you are safe. Uh, you are much safer, of course, if you are part of the NATO, and then within the NATO, you, we. As NATO was growing from the uh, initial number of small, uh, let's say, in, in a teens, uh, so it, the number of the countries have uh, has doubled in the last, um, let's say, twenty years, and uh, and and still NATO has been able to work as a, uh, in a as a united security and defense organization. So apparently, there there is a. Um, uh, there are very very strong arguments for uh, for enlargement uh, um, looking from the pers from perspective of the uh, of the uh, countries that are aspiring for the membership and also looking from the uh, perspective of nato because we we uh, i mean if we look at the uh, the strengths of the uh, uh, defense uh, of this uh, finland that is the late uh, newest member of of nato is, is is very very significant, and uh, NATO has um, uh, gained in, in in that way as well. And we see that basically right now the Ukraine is uh, showing that it is very very capable a uh, capable uh, uh, country in defense um, in, in defense uh, let's say matters and, and and being able sort of to de defend itself. And 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 I think that would be gain for the for for the NATO as well. So that would be my probably initial comment on that question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Zavinsh, for your thoughts, and we're very glad you could join us. Uh, just before I move on to the next question, this is a reminder for those on uh, Zoom and on YouTube that you can submit your questions uh, in the chat function, which we will be asking later. Uh, moving on to the next question, as you alluded to right there, Ambassador Ozulins, and this is also for Ambassador Skusevicius, uh, Latvia and Lithuania are both uh, neighbors to Belarus. Uh, how does the recent conflict between the Russian state and the Wagner Group and continued insecurity regarding the influence of Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, and where he is stationed, factor into your assessment of threat and in NATO's calculations? Do you see non-state threats arising out of the turmoil of the war in Ukraine? Maybe you can start, Ambassador Ozilins. Uh, well, uh, we have um, had um, 
let's say long history in the relationship with uh, with with Belarus since regaining uh, independence and um, Belarus has always been trying let's say to to sit on the fence or being let's say trying to find the best what they can in relations with uh, with Russia but also at some points trying to move closer closer to European uh, to European uh, countries in way of uh, way of life European Union and so on so what what, what do we have seen in uh, since 2014 until uh, 2020 when the uh, elections in 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 Be- Belarus took place and the violent uh, violent oppression of the of the protest of that one so the Belarus was actually very uh careful in in um, let's say assessing uh, um, the annexation of Crimea and and attack on on Don, uh, Donbas uh, regions in, in in Ukraine and did not did not uh, uh, recognize those parts but only after the um, let's say unsuccessful election or let's say the uh, to, to the mind of um, uh, president of Belarus Lukashenko uh, he had to rely on on the Russian on the Russian support the well the uh, 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 let's say displeasure of the uh, of the Belarusians who thought that uh, he's not a uh, uh, winner of that of of that election. So since then, of course, the tone has changed, and especially so after the after the twenty fourth uh, of February twenty twenty two. So uh, since then, we have seen there is no doubt for us that uh, Belarus is part of the conflict because it is aiding, it is helping, it is. Uh, uh, the aggressor state uh, Russia uh, to stage attacks from its uh, territory. It uh, has allowed its territory to be used for launches of the of the missiles and whatnot. So, basically, uh, uh, right now we uh, we we see that uh, Belarus is clearly on the on on the Russia side. We are following we are following uh, let's say daily rants of president lukashenko on tv when he's in a relatively good health because it he's not on every day in a good health um and and um so that uh, that's um uh, let's say paradigm that was until elections of uh, august 2020 has um, has changed and this is also one of the reasons why we are calling on and supporting uh, uh, sanctions that have been applied towards both Belarus and Russia. And what is important to have uh, them in lock and have them synchronized, uh, uh, because we know that one of the uh, the, the, the gist of the eleventh uh, package of the sanctions of the European Union is trying to to uh, close the loopholes, and and that was something that we were calling on the on the earlier rounds. Uh, of sanctions against Belarus and Russia that uh, that we had to synchronize those uh, sanctions so that uh, the Belarus could not be used as a loophole in in, in uh, supplying necessary let's say components and, and and parts for the for the Russian military machine or basically allowing the Belarus to be a place where Russia can through which Russia can uh, still earn the money you know for the uh, for feeding its military um, uh, machine and an aggressive war against against ukraine so there is no no doubt for us for that the other thing we've see we've saw already before uh, a russian aggression against ukraine uh, last year the full, full scale at aggression against ukraine was the uh, uh, belarusian hybrid attack on the uh, on its neighbors, Poland, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, through trying to lure um, um, irregular uh, migrants from uh, from from uh, from Middle East and towards and, and push them towards the uh, European European border. So basically, uh, uh, Lukashenko started to act more aggressive and in a more let's say hybrid manner already before uh, a full scale Russian aggression against. Um, against uh, uh, Ukraine. So from that perspective, of course, this is a new situation for us. We have to take it into account. Um, we are following, we were following the developments in Belarus and its uh, say military cooperation in relationship with Russia, but this is a new new situation with the Belarus being, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, supporting uh, supporting Russia and and also after the statements of uh, uh, bringing tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus and and, all, and especially after the um, 
it was sort of as it is reported negotiated between Lukashenko and 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 Prigozhin that Prigozhin would have a safe haven in, in in Belarus and his his troops. So that in that from that perspective, situation has changed, and we have to follow and act um, adequately to it. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ambassador Skusevichis, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I can I can fully subscribe what uh, what uh, what Kasper just uh, was just telling. Uh, just to just to add one one maybe element is that uh, uh, we shouldn't be hundred um, percent uh, believing in everything we see coming from side of uh, of Russia and uh, even this Prigozhin Wagner group uh, you know what what was happening in recent weeks uh, we we shouldn't be fooled because uh, we don't know what's uh, what's really happening and we will only see it in you know coming uh, coming weeks and months what 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 is really the deal and uh how how it will work in in, in their terms but it might also be uh you know media operation against us trying to fool us and show some you know uh, there are many, there are like number of uh, different kind of evaluations. What is what is really happening there with uh, with different kind of scenarios? What uh, what's going to happen next? But uh, but definitely, what what is uh, what is clear is that uh, Belarus is fully involved into into Russia's uh, war against uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia's aggressive uh, uh, Russia's aggressive uh, behavior uh, you know with regard to to NATO uh, Belarus is in this and uh, and we saw this for a number of years already because like the well, russian troops uh, are are part of you know they are training together with russian troops they are conducting uh, military exercises uh, in most of the cases it's major military exercises around significant to nato country events somewhere on the borders of those events trying to provoke again and again and again so uh, this is clear. Uh, we live in in a difficult uh, neighborhood, and uh, that's one of the reasons why why we are saying that uh, having more allied troops on on our soils and uh, uh, maybe Caspers will add with uh, you know recent announcements of of Canada, but but I see that. We, and this is not only troops, but also equipment, uh, enablers, uh, which are coming together with those troops. We need to be better prepared to fight on the ground, to fight uh, in the sea. And uh, what we see from uh, Ukraine's uh, lessons, uh, Russians uh, were in Ukraine now, that uh, air domain is uh, is a very very important component so we have to continue talking how to protect better our skies as well thank you ambassador um for ambassador rava estonia hosts the nato cooperative cyber defense center of excellence how in particular has the coe further nato's mission to collaborate and innovate Um, well, the, um, uh, that center of excellence is uh, one of many, and then uh, uh, there is one uh, on strategic communication, I think, in uh, Latvia, there is another one on energy related issues in Lithuania, uh, so uh, uh, and the role of these centers of excellence is to uh, look at uh, legal, economic, uh, or uh, uh, public relations aspects of, uh, of the work that NATO member countries do uh, in terms of military or defense. And now cyber uh, is a domain where essentially 
broadly speaking, the sort of rules in real life should also be applicable to the domain of cyber. Uh, but uh, this is not as simple as that. So uh, uh, I would actually mention uh, two uh, concrete uh, things that the center in, uh, in Estonia has uh, uh, come up with uh, that uh, uh, is helping uh, not only NATO member states, but also partners from uh, around the world. One is uh, so-called uh, Tallinn Manual on uh, cyber uh, defense related uh, international law. So that's a fairly thick book. I had a look on it uh, on the web before the seminar. Uh, published by Cambridge Press, and the first edition uh, was written uh, back in 2014 or 15. Now, uh, volume three is being put together, and that uh, um, uh, describes uh, the legal aspects of uh, both defensive, uh, offensive operations, uh, aspects of uh, attribution, uh, meaning. Uh, how can we legally distinguish between the actors who have committed uh, cyber crimes and so on and so forth? So that is a, uh, a work that uh, is being done in, in Tallinn. The other thing is uh, uh, what they themselves call the world's biggest uh, cyber defense exercise called Locked Shields. That is happening every spring in uh, Tallinn. And uh, three or four years ago, I had the chance, uh, because of my work uh, relations back then, to be visiting, not participating, but visiting the site during the um, uh, PR day. And uh, me, as an electronics engineer, I was uh, startled uh, uh, about the complexity and the sheer physical size of the exercise. It was a big hall, uh, in one half of which they had built a small town with uh, water purification pumps, uh, uh, sort of uh, power plants, uh, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, what is there that uh, nowadays all of which are you know, managed or controlled electronically uh, to a certain extent uh, and through all sorts of uh, uh, relays and uh, and uh, small electronic widgets. Uh, these small things uh, on that display could be manipulated uh, uh, from the distance. Then and uh, there you had uh, blue teams, which were actually then the competing teams, and then the red teams who actually tried to disrupt the life of that city. Uh, and uh, so that is the essence of the exercise, and it is really uh, real life replicated in uh, in uh, smaller dimensions, uh, uh, but replicated physically. And uh, and uh, this is an exercise that has been going on for many years now, and that also is. Uh, having participants not only from NATO member countries, but all over the world. The, this year's winners, though, they did come from NATO. No, they didn't. Uh, Sweden uh, was among the winning teams. Sweden and Iceland, the joint team, won uh, this year's exercise, I think. Uh, uh, Poland was uh, third, and uh, Estonia and US uh, got the second place. So, uh, so that is an... Uh, uh, these are two examples that uh, I think are worthwhile mentioning about the practical outcome of the uh, cyber cooperation, cyber defense cooperation center of excellence in Tallinn. Thank you, Ambassador Rava. Thank you for that Estonian perspective. And uh, continuing the spirit of innovation, NATO's Diana, so the Defense uh, Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic Initiative, has just launched. Could uh, you potentially, um, Ambassador Ogilent, uh maybe discuss why innovation is such a key matter for NATO 
and how uh, Latvia is working towards supporting the development of emerging and disruptive technologies. Well, indeed. Well, this is new, new area. I think it was agreed by the uh, by all of the NATO countries a couple of summits ago that um, um, the abbreviation was EDT. It's emerging disruptive technologies, indeed. Uh, and so there is recognition that you can do so much with the uh, with the new technology without actually using uh, 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 weaponry and and typical military weaponry. And we saw it. Uh, through the use of social media, you know, the interference in the elections in referenda, especially in 2016 in the US elections and the uh, UK, UK referendum on, on, on the Brexit. So you can tilt uh, uh, results and and um, and interfere into democ democratic process, you know, processes. Uh, the, uh, the things that was just mentioned by my colleague Estonian ambassador, so this is how you use the cyberspace actually for malicious, malicious activity. And... Uh, this is again something that we need to learn from each other. Uh, we need to upgrade the standards. So what Estonians have done with, with done with the man, manual have basically addressed the issue. If we need to, if we need to uh, um, draft a new international law for for cyber defense, and their response, uh, their uh, uh, answer was basically no. So the, the international law is. Uh, can sufficiently be used to address the cyber uh, 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 cyber attacks um, issues. Uh, so basically, uh, there is no vacuum in that sense. And then there are other issues that are coming into the uh, uh, into the focus where technology is is becoming more uh, potent, potent. Let's say to um, uh, to uh, to bring a havoc into the our um, daily daily life. So let's say uh, let's see. Uh, 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 about the space, the space technologies, you know, how the uh, communication satellites or, or other satellites can be, um, uh, their function can be interrupted in, in the space and how we can counter counter those uh, those actions. Or basically, if we know that, that, that in China there is a, um, uh, say, uh, order to the... Uh, scientific community to think when they are thinking about the new technology so that they should think about the dual use of the military use as well uh, as well right away from the very start from the very inset of any any new idea so this is this basically raises the uh, raises let's say the red flag and we we we, we need to think uh, in the similar in the similar terms so and and i i, I guess with the uh, with technology, uh, I mean, with new technologies coming in, and especially the, um, let's think of uh, quantum computers, let's say coming in, and artificial intelligence coming in. So there will be multiple uses and multiple ways actually how to use those technologies to gain uh, to gain advantage against the, uh, against the other countries. So those issues need to be addressed. So when I think we are we've made the. A right decision at NATO to uh, sort of to collectively address that that issue and and look at the all type of uh, the different 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 technologies. So I think every country was able to uh, express its um, um, uh, let's say uh, wishes and willingness which way they would want to work on the uh, on the innovation side and on the technology side and 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 which hubs and clusters do they want to uh, host on their on their soil and of course with regard you mentioned the yana so um, uh, we will have only two of those centers one in one in europe and one in one in the one in canada in halifax as far as i understand and then there will be other test test beds and 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 um, um, uh, for for uh, for smaller uh, let's say for individual, uh, let's say technological technological issues. So in that sense, I think in last year's example is that we are serving as a, as a five G test bed for military use and military applications. So we can have a demonstration on the on the on that on that site in 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 Latvia and the other countries of the NATO could use could use those <clears throat> those things. So basically, we see we are seeing that the. Uh, um, Adversarial action is moving from the ground to different areas as well. And we need to address those issues.
uh, of course, and I, I paused a little bit because we uh, we didn't expect that the full scale military attack, the ground attack, and air um, uh, attacks and everything will come back. Let's say the tactics of the Second World War, but now there there we go. So we have to uh, look at the all the all directions. So the threats may come from all the from all directions, and including from the uh, um, um, use of technology into uh, um, security uh real as well yeah thank you ambassador ojo lynch um and thank you all ambassadors for your thoughts on innovation and specifically look at the european arena um here's a question for ambassador skuskovicius in march gabrielis landsberg is the minister of foreign affairs of lithuania spoke to the center for strategic international studies about the threat of chinese economic coercion and mentioned that china would be able would china would be on the table at vilnius what progress might leaders hope to achieve on NATO-China relations? It's a very, very good question. And uh, yes, uh, even though we are uh, most of the time mostly focused on uh, on, on our region and our, our own security, uh, but uh, we we also see, and it's in uh, in the radars of NATO for quite some time, is uh, not only Russia, but also China. And uh, and uh, and challenges this country is posing to to global global society, uh, and therefore um, we will have one of the sessions at the summit will be with uh, Indo Indo Pacific partners with uh, Japan, Australia, uh, South Korea, and New Zealand. So uh, so this is important, uh, you know, and and I think continuation to uh, talk with those partners and then to see what can be done together because uh, Canada for example if its announcement of Indo-Pacific strategy has a, a military component uh, in it as well other partners uh, are doing uh, uh, some you know security guarantees in that region uh, as well so so having this kind of uh, debate, how we can uh, help uh, our uh, like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific is uh, is a really important one. And uh, you know uh, what uh, what my minister was uh, was saying, uh, uh, we had uh, big challenges with uh, with China in the uh, past several years and. Uh, uh, so definitely, we are we are interested in uh, joint conversation about uh, how we address uh, such kind of challenges. And uh, Ambassador Rava, Ambassador Ozilinch, would you have anything to add on uh, Indo-Pacific cooperation as being key to future deterrence capabilities of NATO? Well, well I may rubble. Okay, <laughs> very, very one, one sentence probably. So I, I think we are not gone that far. So one thing, of course, we are looking at the, as I said at the very beginning. So we are looking at the best possible ways how we secure ours, our, our, um, let's say, peace way of life, how we deter of any uh, um, uh, aggression. And, and things like that. So basically, we have to be uh, capable to deter against any, everything. So uh, that harms our, let's say, societies and our security of our countries and societies, indeed. So uh, and as we spoke in the previous question, you know, so you have so many vectors, uh, threat vectors, so many ways how you can be harmed. So the first thing basically is have a conversation, have a conversation among all of the NATO countries first, you know, what we can learn, what we can know about the about the uh, um, uh, uh, threats coming from different parts, that, uh, parts of the world, you know, the threats that might be uh, might be global, How, what we can learn also from other countries uh, in, in those parts of the world. So the most like minded countries uh, of ours, of course, are the countries in the in the Pacific region. And knowing that, uh, knowing that um, uh, everything, I mean, if the uh, if the P5 countries are engaged, so that the issues are strategic, those are big global issues. And we need to learn more first 
and 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 see how we are what is the issue that's coming at our plate and how we are learning about it how we are understanding it so that we uh, can be more or less on the same page you know that let's say on the example of ukraine or let's say starting from georgia in 2008 there was war against the neighboring country of russia and on on the other end on our end there was let's say different views of what we are doing about it so we the baltic states said well we need to sanction russia because uh, it may not step, stop there. So that was not the prevailing view. After 22, so that's 14 years later, all of us are on the same page uh, in reading in reading security situation and what we need to do as well. So this is a level of unity we have never had at NATO. So God forbid similar things would happen in other parts of the world that would also equally influence influence us. So we may not have a 14 years time, let's say, to learn and come on the same page, you know, and, and reading the situation, uh, the security situation and, and the potential steps uh, from the NATO side. So we need to come together uh, early on and learn more uh, so that we make uh, right, right uh, preparation um, in West in, uh, in the right ways, in West in the right technologies, in West in the unity. Uh, uh, so that we can make at the end the uh, the, the right decisions and also unanim unanimous decisions in, in in unity among all of the NATO countries. So I think that's that's the core. It's not that we are at the outset right now are looking at the some kind of uh, um, um, specific uh, capacities. Although the the consultation itself, it is I guess uh, it is a deterrent has a deterrent effect effect as well. So we are signaling that we are looking around the world, looking at uh, different parts where some, uh, let's say, challenges might uh, come, uh, come at us and we want to be, let's say, sharp on those issues uh, early on. And I would like to highlight an element uh, that is... Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, within the strategic concept of NATO uh, adopted last at the last summit uh, uh, in Madrid, and there uh, the partnership between China and Russia uh, is something that uh, the NATO member countries are having uh, uh, a close eye on, and uh, these two countries have had, for instance, joint naval exercises, not only in the Pacific, but also on the Baltic Sea, uh, just beside Riga or, or Tallinn. So these two countries uh, do cooperate in some spaces, and Russia being a uh, <clears throat> violator of, uh, of all uh, possible principles, and China has not been very clear cut in condemning all this. Uh, so this is uh, a matter of concern. And uh, from the Estonian point of view, I think it was our uh, minister during the annual foreign policy, foreign policy presentation in the parliament in February. Uh, he said that uh, Estonia also has backed out like Latvia and Lithuania from the 16 plus one framework uh, of uh, cooperation between China and a number of Central and East European countries. And one of the reasons was exactly the uh, Chinese attitudes and reactions uh, to the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine. Thank you, Ambassador Raba, and thank you to all of the ambassadors who participated today, and thank you for your thoughts. Looking forward to Vilnius on July 11th to uh, July 12th, 2023. Um, we've discussed Canada's role in bolstering security through an enhanced forward presence, how the Baltic states are responding to events in Belarus and Russia in the last few weeks, the increased innovation um, as being key for deterrent capabilities, and the key role for the Indo-Pacific. I'm now going to pass it along to NATO Association of, of Canada President Robert Baines to um, pull us in. Thanks so much, Matthew Damico. Great job, Ali Sayani. Thank you so much for taking us through this. Uh, Ambassador Rava, Ambassador Oslins, uh, Ambassador Skusevicius, uh, always a pleasure. 
Uh, I think that these kinds of discussions are so important to uh, galvanize the Canadian public to make sure that they understand the complex issues that we have to deal with. Uh, and it always amazes me how much agreement NATO has been able to gather uh, over the past year and what, four or five months since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, it gives me heart. Uh, it gives me such uh, a forward looking uh, optimism to see what we've accomplished. And I look forward to seeing what happens next week. Uh, we haven't touched Canadian defense spending, obviously. That's not your remit, but I'll be watching that closely. Um, but I just hope that most Canadians who are watching now realize that this is not something we can skimp on. Uh, these are our friends, uh, our great allies. And uh, Ambassador Rava, I see you have one, one last point, too. Uh, yes, I uh, uh, I cannot uh, avoid telling a story how uh, allies uh, spending militarily would create economic security. Uh, there is a Canadian uh, uh, company called Neo Performance Materials based in Toronto, and they are into rare earth minerals mining, processing, and then making magnets out of them. And they own a factory in Estonia. Silmet uh, since about uh, seven or eight years ago, which uh, produces the uh, rare earth metal or oxides, neodymium, praseodymium. And currently they, these uh, metals are shipped to uh, Asia to make magnets that go into cars and wind turbines. Uh, in 2021, they started thinking about building a factory uh, in Estonia next to the current one to make magnets. Then came February. 22, and they got afraid. It's a publicly listed company, so all the investors uh, uh, started asking questions, what if Russia bombs the factory? And it took the company about uh, six months uh, to get uh, convinced that uh, NATO security uh, is there. And uh, by November, they had made their investment decision to the tune of uh, 100 million Canadian dollars. And the groundbreaking of that factory happened last week. So uh, without the Canadian uh, contingent in Latvia, or the German in Lithuania, or Brits in Estonia, and all the other partners who are also doing the air policing, and you know, Finland joining, all that uh, has contributed uh, also to the fact that um, uh, you know, investments move around. People are not afraid to put their money right next to the Russian border because it is within NATO. So that's how, uh, uh, to put it bluntly, money spent on defense will uh, create in income for the companies and eventually for the people as well. Certainly. Thank you. That's, that, that's a story I, uh, I had to tell. I didn't find the possibility during the... The to weave it in, system. yes. <laughs> but it's always wise to remind ourselves of that, that NATO is not only within our values, but in our interest as well. Uh, and that's unequivocal. Uh, so thank you so much for, for bringing that out. And thank you to all uh, for participating. Uh, again, the NATO Association continues to, to educate Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Uh, please do follow us on social media, uh, obviously on YouTube, etc. Uh, we do have another event next week, which will be on the second day of the NATO summit. Uh, that will be on July 12th at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be going through uh, some of the, uh, uh, the results of the NATO summit. Uh, what are some of the decisions and hopefully what are the Canadian announcements about further defense spending? Uh, so thanks so much, uh, all of you excellencies for joining and Matthew and Ali, great job. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much.